Okay, good morning, everyone. So this is our second to the last lecture of this class before your final presentations. So today I'm going to finish our discussion on the linear mixed effect models or also known as hierarchical linear models. And then for the next lecture, next and last lecture, I will talk about model selection using AIC, BIC, and MALOCP, and also there's AICC, which is a corrected version of AIC. But for the last lecture, I will make an announcement on CCLE to say that we will do it on next Tuesday in a week. The reason is that I have a time conflict this Thursday for a review panel. So that's why we are not going to talk about that this week, but don't worry that this last part, model selection, will not be in your home, last homework. So your last homework will only cover up to the linear mixed effect models. So that's just an optional lecture, in other words. But still, I will be, I'll appreciate if you can attend the last lecture because I think that's very useful. And, what, and so AIC and BSC are widely used in our practice. So today, to wrap up this LMM, I will try to explain what we said last time. And also I will give you some good examples which I grabbed from the internet. So I will show you two interesting posts, one of which we have briefly looked at last time and also some lecture notes from other, another professor, which I think is very informative. Okay, that's the plan. And so first of all, let's revisit the parameter estimation problem in our LMM. So we call that the third approach or the third, this third presentation, a third way of writing down the LMM is just in the form of linear model. So we put all the random parts into a combined term called epsilon star. And we see that this epsilon star is no longer a vector that has a, a random vector that has a diagonal covariance matrix. The reason is that we have those Z matrix. So to give you a reminder of that. So this is the Z matrix we have in our model. So that Z is just, uh, you can consider as the design matrix for the random effects. And also it has another name called block effect, block matrix, which is about how your observations are grouped into groups. So given that, so V is defined as Z, G, Z transpose plus R. R is the variance covariance matrix of the random error vector. So together, V is unlikely to be diagonal. And we just write it as a variance covariance matrix for this random vector epsilon star. So with that, to estimate the beta, the fixed effects, the problem becomes a linear model with non homoscedastic random errors. But still, we can always use the likelihood approach. So we write the likelihood as this. And please also know that for simplification, we assume that for our variance terms, which is the combined term V or the separate term G and R. G is the variance covariance matrix of our random effect vector delta. And R is the variance covariance matrix of a random error vector R. So they can all be specified just by the theta. So theta is the variance component vector, a variance component parameter. So together, the likelihood will be beta, a function of beta and theta. And we'll write it out. And we want to maximize it. So the clear approach here is to use the profile likelihood approach, that is, we first consider theta to be given, and we find which value of beta given the theta will maximize the likelihood. And then we found that, yeah, the beta is just the weighted least square formula. So we have x transpose v theta inverse x. Together, this product is going to be inverse times x transpose v theta inverse y. Okay, that's the formula we have seen before from the weighted least squares. And we can actually show that this is the form by using vector calculus. And with this beta hat given theta, we plug it back into the likelihood and then we get a profile likelihood of theta. So you see here the beta hat is replaced by beta hat, 
beta half, sorry, so here in the likelihood beta is replaced by beta half theta and theta remains. So the whole likelihood becomes just a function of theta. We call this profile likelihood and we write it as LP. Then what's remaining is to estimate theta by maximizing this profile likelihood. And this is the theta hat ML. So we have the theta hat ML in this way, but the issue with that, this is biased. So as a recall, we can remind ourselves about the case when we have that variance estimation problem, if you still remember. In that variance estimation problem, which I wrote down last time, here, we would have the theta hat ML squared equal to one over N times the summation of YI minus the mu hat MLE, where the mu hat MLE is just the average of Y1 to YN. But we know that this is biased. And to address this issue, where the bias comes from, is that we use the same data for twice for estimating the mean and the variance. In other words, when we estimate the variance, we must consider that our data has already been used to estimate the mean. And the mean is not a free parameter. It depends on our data also. So this makes us to restrict our data by removing one degree of freedom. And by restriction here, the simple approach is to just get rid of the mean. So for example, if we do y2 minus y1, y3 minus y2, up to yn minus yn minus one. We get only n minus one such restricted data points and their mean is zero. So mu is removed. And the only parameter with that, need, that need to be estimated is sigma square. So with this, we can actually derive the restricted maximum likelihood estimator with the denominator n minus one. So it is the same idea that we want to use here. That is to estimate this, the variance term theta, variance component parameter theta without bias, what we want to do is to remove beta from the likelihood. So we will only have one theta. And here the removal is not by plugging the MLE of beta as a function of theta, like we do in the profile likelihood. Because here the beta, the beta is just soft, right? It's just soft based on the ML. E, maximum likelihood estimation, it's not all possibilities of beta. So what we do for the marginal likelihood approach, which is also called a restricted maximum likelihood approach, is to integrate our beta. So what's left in our so-called marginal likelihood is only theta, beta is gone. In other words, here we just consider all possibilities of beta. For each value of beta, we evaluate the likelihood and we take the sum, we take evaluate the likelihood of beta and we take the sum of all those likelihood. And what's surprising here is that because of the special form of normal density here, we can actually rewrite this term for the integration. So we can actually get a closed form integration for beta. And after the integration, the marginal likelihood only has a special term as this, which is very important. So you see that what's happening here is that the marginal likelihood is just equal to the profile likelihood we have seen before, or the log, log marginal likelihood is equal to the log profile likelihood minus a third term, another term. And this term is one half times log of the determinant of X transpose, the fixed part design matrix, V theta inverse X. So in other words, based on what we wrote here, so let me just grab a new piece of paper. What we have is a very important result. That is, if we want to find the maximizer of the log marginal likelihood. Okay, so based on this formula, if you recall, we have the term called deviance, which is negative two times the log likelihood. Okay, so if we talk about the deviance, put it here, which is negative two times 
the log likelihood is actually two terms, okay? Log likelihood of, let me just write it here, of a model, if we recall that's what we have, minus the log likelihood of the saturated model, right? That's how we evaluated the goodness of fit for a GLM, something we used before. So therefore, you see, to calculate the deviance, it is important to have negative two times the log likelihood. Then let's take a look at that. What's that? Negative two times log likelihood. So the first thing we look at is the negative two times log profile likelihood. Okay, so I'll just write this LP theta, which is here. And essentially, we can see that there are some constant for sure in the log likelihood. And we're going to use this beta hat MLD theta to replace beta. So I'll just write it as um, some constant. Okay. And because negative two is going to be canceled with negative one half, I have plus log of the determinant V theta. Okay. And the second term you see negative two is going to be canceled with negative one half as well. So I have plus y minus x beta hat theta. I'll just call that x beta hat theta um, transpose times v theta inverse times x minus y minus x transpose beta hat theta. That's it. That will be the form of my negative two log likelihood. And then let's take a look at the log marginal likelihood. So you see, it's just the same term, but minus another one half times this, but this minus one half is going to be canceled with negative two as well. So therefore, if I write negative two log marginal likelihood of theta, I am going to have and there's another constant, sorry, I should say that out. So there's another constant, which is not exactly equal to the constant in the LP, in the profile like this. So I'll just call that constant prime, another constant, plus this will stay log V theta plus Y minus X beta hat theta transpose V theta inverse times Y minus X beta hat theta. Okay. And finally, this negative one half is going to be canceled with the minus two. So I'll have plus log X transpose V theta inverse X. That's it. So you see in the, if I want to find the theta hat, by maximizing the negative two log likelihood, my objective function is different because for the marginal likelihood, based on large likelihood, I'm going to have the third term that need to be considered in my maximization. So just to summarize, the theta hat ML is the arg max of theta, depending on how you define theta of these two terms, or I'll just write minus two LP theta versus if I do theta hat REML is the arg max of the negative two log marginal likelihood of theta this term. So they have different objective functions and therefore you may get different maximizers. That's it. And with this variance component parameter estimated, then you can do a lot of things. So for example, we know that under the assumption, see here, under the assumption that V theta is known, remember we talk about the case for known variances. So in this case, with theta known, we have V theta is known. 
So what would give us is that if we talk about the MLE of beta hat, this one, this formula, then we would have say beta hat MLE simply as X transpose V inverse X inverse X transpose V inverse Y. Okay, and for this one, we can easily derive its variance, covariance matrix. So we write variance of beta hat MLE, which can be shown just equal to X transpose V inverse X inverse. That will be the variance covariance matrix of beta. And know that this is a P by P matrix, okay? So, so naturally, if I want to do inference for any parameter in my beta, I can just use this variance covariance matrix as we used for our GLM. So in our GLM, remember, this weight matrix is going to come from our iteratively reweighted least square IRLS algorithm from the last iteration. And for our LM, we will just get this part out as a sigma square outside a scalar. And that sigma square is going to be estimated by that restricted maximum likelihood formula. And here, you see, if I want to do inference, the natural way is to do plug-in. That is, if you don't have the theta known, which is the case, we will just plug in this V theta hat, okay? Inverse X negative one. So when theta is unknown, that is estimated, right? So then with this, you can do inference on beta. For example, you can use the diagonal terms as your estimated variance for each beta hat J. And then you can talk about the confidence interval beta J. You can do the ten wall test for testing whether a subcomponent of beta is equal to zero, something like that. So all the inference procedures we talk about can be carried over in this way. Okay, but one thing to know that is if this is the thing you want to do, the default option is to use theta hat R E M L to do plugging. The reason is that we know the R E M L theta hat is unbiased. So we prefer to use an unbiased estimator to plug in an unknown parameter. So that's why the default option in any R packages is to use the R E M L for the variance component estimator as the variance component estimator. Okay, but in some cases, you do want to use the theta hat ML under which case? When you want to do likelihood ratio test, if you want to compare two likelihoods, right? So based on, and you're going to use the full likelihood of beta and theta. If you want to compare those, then you want to use the maximizer of the true likelihood. And the maximizer would just be the theta hat ML and its corresponding beta hat, given the theta hat ML. So that's the case you want to use the theta hat ML when you care about the likelihood. But if you, what you care about estimating theta alone, then REML is recommended because it's unbiased. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So that's the thing I want to wrap up to say that, okay, how we do the estimation. And so there are several inference problem after that. So for the statistical inference, or we can say parameter inference. So then you can see we care about two things. One is beta, one is theta. So we could care about like the fixed effect like we always do. For example, the null hypothesis is this beta j equal to zero, whether a certain component of my fixed effect is zero, which we're going to see an example here. Or we can also have, so this is just like one component. Okay, so beta j is just one component. 
And we can also test a sub vector being zero. Let's just say beta two equals to zero, where say beta two has P two dimensions as we have seen before. So these can, remember we have talked about the wall test for the second case and the likelihood ratio test, which is approximate. And also we talk about ANOVA. ANOVA can give us the F test for second testing the second part. So we have three ways of doing the second to address the second problem. And ANOVA and wall test have asymptotic normal distribution, while the F test has exact F distribution if our normal linear model assumption holds. And for the first part, we talk about the T test, which is the one dimensional version of the wall test. And we can also do the likelihood ratio test and F test as well. Okay, and now for the random effects, we can ask about something. So probably talking about theta is too abstract. So you don't know what exactly theta means. But think of the prof problem where we have the theta for the random intercept model, RIM. Recall that over there, the theta has two components, omega square and delta sigma square, right? So omega square is just the variance of the random intercept, while the sigma square is the variance of the random errors. So then I could ask the question, the null hypothesis would be omega square equal to zero, which means do I trust that, do I really think there is variance among the random intercepts? Know that each random intercept corresponds to one group, right? Do, is there any real difference between the groups, among the groups? To answer this question, we can do this test. And if we reject the null hypothesis, it means that, yeah, we do think including the random intercepts for groups is meaningful. Otherwise, if we don't have strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis, we tend to think probably we would just we need we can just reduce our model, simplify our model by removing the random intercepts because there's no clear evidence to show that the groups do have different intercepts. So that's why this random effect test is also very useful and important for our random effects or for our model construction. So what I'm going to do next is trying to show you how we're going to do the fixed effects and the random effects, okay? But I think probably it's good for me to, before talking about this in the last part, I will, I will show you the, a very nicely written blog about the linear mixed effect model LMM from scratch. And I think what's really nice from there is that it has a very simple toy example, which is very illustrative and also, that toy example can allow us to see how we can do the calculation by hand for this whole estimation, okay? Because the data is so simple and the model is just a random intercept model, it's possible to do that derivation just by linear algebra by hand. So let's take a look at that first and then we will see some concrete examples in R about testing whether we have fixed effects and whether, whether we have random effects. Okay, so I'll stop sharing this screen and let's move on to see the web page. Okay, so here it is. Please know that I posted the link to our week nine on CCLE. So this is the linear model, mixed model from scratch. And let me enlarge the screen, the, the font size a little bit so we can see more clearly. So yeah, so if you want to check out the whole blog series of the author, you can do that. I think it's a very nicely written blog. Yeah, so that's why I want to, I want to use this example to further clarify things. So first, let's look at the toy data set the author created. So the toy data set is very simple, the simplest you could imagine, okay? So it has only four data points and, or we can say sample size capital M in our notation is equal to four. 
So two are from individual one and two are from individual two. So we have two individuals and the four points have two conditions, untreated and treated. Okay, and what you measure as the why is the response of each individual to the treatment. And you would like to address whether the treatment resulted in a significant response of the individuals in this study. So in other words, for each individual, you have two points, one untreated, one treated. So therefore, you see, this is exactly the case where we can do the pair T test, right? We could actually just take the difference for individual one, like treated minus untreated. We could do that for individual number two as well. So then we have two differences. And then we can test whether there is the two differences can have support or reject the null hypothesis that the mean is zero, their mean is zero. So that's the thing we're going to see next. And the author actually showed exactly that in this special scenario, the LMM is just equivalent to the pair T test, which we also mentioned in our first lecture about LMM, if you watch the video recording. Okay, so yeah, we're going to show that they are equivalent Okay, so in the toy data set, zero in the treat column implies untreated, one means treated. So the, this treat column is a factor with two levels, zero or one. So first of all, we can pretend that we don't have those two individuals or that four data points are just IID without the, or I would say the independent with no grouping structure. So in that case, we can just do least square or least linear regression. So here's our data frame. We see that here the treat 0, 1, 0, 1, and the response is our Y, 10, 25, 3, 6. And we have the individual index, 1, 1, T2, which means that the first two data points belong to individual one, the third and the fourth belong to the individual two. Okay, so then what we do is that, so the author plotted the data, let's take a look. So you see, these two points belong to individual one, and this is the Y, we're plotting the Y. And these two belong to individual two, and we plot the treatment in the X axis. This is treat untreated, this is treated. So clearly we see that there is some increase in response after treatment. We see increase here, increase here, but clearly the two slopes are different. Okay. So that's the data, but let's see the result for linear regression, LMM response regressed on the treatment. And so we get an intercept and we get a treatment slope. This slope is just the average, okay, the average of the two slopes, the red one and the green one. So that gives us nine. And we see this is the residual standard error right? This is what? This is just how we estimate the sigma. The sigma, the random error standard deviation, that's the estimate. And two degrees of freedom, two here stands for m minus p. So we have n equals four, p equals two. We have an intercept, we have a slope, so that, that gave us two. Okay, that's the other things we have. And clearly, you see, based on this, we do not see a very significant effect for our treatment. Because if you look at the p-value, it's quite small, it's quite big. The reason here is that we have only four data points. That's the primary reason. <laughs> so although this estimate for the slope is quite big, nine, which is very different from zero, but the p-value is actually very small just because we have a, such a small sample size. And also for your information, the data looks like this. So we have four data points, four rows. This is the y response. This is the treatment, our interest the predictor. This is the individual. And please know that in the linear model, we didn't use the individual information at all. We just ignored this column. Okay, so the author said that we actually violated the independence assumption in the linear model because here we have two individuals. So clearly the two data points from the same individual are not, in, are not independent, okay? So, and this is what we get if we fit one regression per individual. So you see, we have two points of individual one, we can get a perfect fit 
and we have two points for individual two, we have a perfect fit. So here the perfect fit can be understood intuitively as given two points, we can always draw a line, straight line that goes through it. And also you can think of it as here we have two data points and we have two parameters, the intercept and the slope. So we can get a perfect fit. Okay. And this is the, the extreme one, one extreme we set. We fit one, one linear regression within the group. Clearly, this is not so desirable here, right? And another extreme is that we just reg regress four points together. And so that's what we did already in the linear model. We are doing the regression of four points together. But here the issue is we, we ignore and validate independence. And here we don't have that violation, but we just don't have so many data points. So that's why we need to find a balance trade off between the two. And that's the LMM. Okay, so this is the package we're going to use in R for the implementation of the LMM. It's called LME4. And this package and its function called LMER has a special notation. So this is what the formula looks like. You're going to put the fixed effect you're interested in here, and you're going to put the random effects in, per, in a parenthesis. So what we mean here by one conditional on independent, so this vertical thing means conditional, like the conditional in probability. And what is specified here is, okay, whether it's about Mm, the group is going to be put afterwards and whether it's an intercept or a specific slope that you want to consider to be random is going to put going to be put in the front. So here this means that we're considering an, a random intercept in addition to the fixed effect. So note that we don't specify the intercept here, but it's included. So we always have a fixed intercept. And what's in the parenthesis is the additional random intercept that has mean zero. So the part we have in our delta, but this is what we have in our beta, if you recall the mathematical notations we used before. And this one means that we're considering just the intercept being random. So you can consider that I may add another term with a parenthesis and in the parenthesis, I write treat conditional on int individual. So then if I add that term, it means that, okay, I'm also considering the slope of treatment to be random. Okay, here I only consider the intercept to be random, which means that I can allow the two linear lines to have different intercepts. So they, they go through different values on the y-axis. So here's about like 10, here's about like three or two. So you see their intercepts do differ. And here this model just account for that, but it doesn't allow the slope to be different. It assumes the same slope, the fixed effect. Okay, does that make sense to you? If you have any questions, please just raise your hand or speak up. Okay, so then I'll continue. And okay, here we have the DF. Okay, there is something I want to draw your attention to. Let's go back. The DF is just a data frame. The data, the data frame name or the data set name, you put it here. So that here, the R, RESP response, the treatment are all column names in the data frame. And here we specifically said that REML equals false because in default, by default in LMER function, REML is said to be true. So you're going to use REML for estimating the variance components, but here we said it to be false. So then the maximum likelihood approach is going to be used or the profile likelihood approach is going to be used for variance estimation. And let's take a look at outcome or the output. So that's the model and also give you the AIC, BIC log likelihood deviance. You see the deviance is defined as negative two times log likelihood. Okay, and here we have no residual degrees of freedom. Okay, and let's see why. The reason is that we actually have two fixed effects. Okay, you see, intercept treatment, two fixed effects. We have two random effects, the variance of the error term, that is our sigma square, and the variance of our 
random intercepts. That's just omega squared. So together we have four parameters and we have four observations. So there's no left degrees of freedom. And based on this, you see something is changed. So by considering the random effects as random intercepts, which is here, you see that we are basically redistributing the variance that cannot be explained by the line, the fixed effects into two parts. One part to the random errors, the other part to the random intercepts. And if we take a close look at their sum, you see this is 33 plus 0.25, 18. So together they will give me like 51.25. And if we scroll back here, so actually comparing to this, that, that's the total for that variance part. So they are actually redistributed from the residual variance here. So if we think of it, so this one is one, well, 10.12, if we square it, we have about 100, okay? But here, don't forget that this 100 is actually considering the degree of freedom. So it was actually divided. So you, if you obtain that 100, okay, by dividing something with M minus two, M minus P, so that's two. So we have about 200 in total for that sum of variances or square sum. And so go down here, you see that here that we have the variances that also accounted for that um, with, the, with, with the denominator. So sorry, I, I, I will see that later. So about the calculation exactly, but just intuitively, let's know that, okay, they come from the same source where you cannot explain your variance in the response by the fixed effects. Okay, and if we remember the fixed effects was 6.5 and 9 in the linear model. So they stay the same. They stay the same. But what's different is their standard error. So it used to be 7 and 10, 7.1, 10.1. Now you see the standard errors are much smaller. It's 5 and 4 instead of 7 and 10. And why is that? The reason is now you allow the individuals or the groups to have different intercepts. So you are no longer attributing that differences in the intercept to just random error. And you actually assume that is group specific difference. So as a result, a consequence of that different modeling is that you do not think your estimate of the fixed intercept and the fixed treatment slope are as variable as they used to be under the linear model. And then because of the smaller standard error you attribute to your fixed effect parameter estimates, the resulting T values are bigger because the T value is just the estimate divided by the standard error. So 6.5 divided by five, nine divided by 4.2. So they are bigger. So here's their 1.2 and 2.1, but they used to be, they used to be 0 0.9 and 0 0.8. So you're more likely to get a bigger T value and a smaller P value so that you will reject the now hypothesis about the fixed effect to say, yeah, the treatment indeed has an effect. You're more likely to say that in the using the LMM approach. Does that make sense to you? Okay, great. And then what else was reported by this package, LM, function LMER, is the correlation of the fixed effect. So in other words, what's that? This is just from that matrix right here. So remember the X transpose V inverse X inverse. So that from that variance covariance matrix of beta hat, beta hat, we're going to get a off diagonal entry. And that's about the covariance between the two estimates. And the correlation is just that covariance divided by the square root divided by the product of the square root of the variance. So it's actually covariance divided by this and divided by this. That gives us a correlation. 
Okay, it's just to give you some idea that, okay, here the treatment and the intercept, that these two estimates, they have a negative correlation, which is actually reasonable. We actually know that they are correlated, right? So we should expect that this correlation is not zero. Okay, so here in this argument, REML equals false, which is what we do here simply implies that we are using traditional ML optimization and not the REML. And in the random effects of the output, let's say what the, authors, what the author wrote, we see estimates of two parameters of minimization, residual variance corresponding to the standard deviation 4.243, okay, that's here. And the random effects shared between individual variants associated with the intercept, the standard deviation 5.766. Similarly, in the fixed effect section of the LMER output, we see two estimates for the intercept equal to 6.5 and the slope for the treatment equal to 9. Therefore, we have four parameters for op optimization that correspond to four data points. The values of fixed effects make sense if you look at the very first figure in the toy data, toy data set section and realize that the mean of the two values for the untreated samples is 6.5. Okay, so that's the intercept right here. We have here. So if we take the average of those two and that gave us the intercept, that's exactly 6.5. Okay, and we will have the intercept you know that's beta one. Just remember the notation just here. And the mean of the treated sample is 15.5. Do you know that's beta two? So clearly, if we do the difference between the two things, we get a slope. Because in the treatment, we have zero and one. So this is zero, this is one. So exactly when I take the difference between the mean here and the difference of the mean here, their difference is just nine. Okay, that's the slope we can calculate by hand. And they agree with the output of linear regression and LMM. So they stay the same. The point estimates stay the same. And here we are going to talk about how we estimate the variance, the, the exact values of random and fixed effects because we're going to reproduce them. Okay, so please know that. This is something very interesting to know. The LME4 package and the LMERR function do not provide measures of statistical significance such as p-values. That's what we saw here. Although we got a point estimate for the fixed effect, it's associated standard error. So we could do the division to get a t-value, but there's no p-value reported for the t-value. And we actually were going to see why. Okay, but first, this is the fact that LMER package, LMER function doesn't do. And, sorry, yeah. Okay, but if you still would like to have a p-value for your LMM fit, you may use another R package called NLME, and the function name is LME. So you don't have R, you just have LMA. And this is, the formula. So you know that the formula notation is a little different. You have to specify the fixed effects and the random effects in two separate arguments. This is the fixed part, response regress on treatment. This is the random effect part, the intercept. You're considering the random intercept associated with individuals. And here, if you specify the method to be ML, okay, you can also choose ML versus REML. But let's say you look at R, the ML, then you are going to get a T value and a P value. Okay, so that's the thing you can get from this package. And the one thing you want to see here is very interesting. So the random effect for the intercept, the standard deviation, okay, is 5.76. And for the residual, which is your random error part, is 4.24. And the fixed effects remain as 6.5 and 9. But interestingly, here, the T values, okay, let's see here, 0 0.9 for the random intercept, uh, 0.9 for the fixed intercept estimate, 1.5 for the fixed treatment effect estimate. They do not agree with what we have for the LMER. So remember 0 0.9, 1.5. What we had was 
1.2, 2.1. So you see the two values do not agree between the two functions. Okay, what's wrong? <laughs> the reason is I think it's just that different people wrote a different package that have different definition of what they mean by ML. So if we actually set the REML equal to true in the LMER function, okay, in the previous one, then the fixed effects using T values are identical. So what we mean is that although here we said that the method is equal to ML, but it's not the same as when we say here, REML equals false in LMER function. Because in the LMER function, when you set REML equal to false, essentially the random effects, these and these are estimated by ML. Okay, they are not estimated by REML. So they are going to affect how we estimate the variance of the fixed effects mix because they're going to affect the theta hat, so the V theta hat. So that's what we have here. But in this other function or package NLME and this function LME, so when we say the method equals ML, we just mean that the mean parameters here are estimated by ML, but the standard errors are still, or the variance related components are still estimated by REML. I think that's very confusing myself. So that's why you need to pay close attention by when you use this package, you should check, do cross check with the LMER function, the one we recommended in your homework, the LME4 package to make sure that they do agree with each other. Okay, does that make sense? So then you see, when we switch back to the LMER function and set REML to equal to true, and this is what we get, and this is what we get, 7.16, or let's look at this, 0 0.9, 1.5. Okay, 0 0.9, 1.5. So they agree with each other now, yeah. Okay, so that's just the introduction of the two R packages we can use for our fitting our linear mixed effect model and do statistical inference. And we are going to talk about why this package LME4 don't report a p-value for not for user's convenience clearly, but here for this other package, it reports a p-value. So we'll revisit this topic very soon. But let's first take look another look at this interesting equivalence between LMM and pair t-test, which is the case for the special case. Okay, so previously we said that LMM is more complex form of a simple pair t-test. Let us demonstrate that for our toy data set, the four data point data set, they do give identical outputs. On the way, we will also understand the technical difference between paired and unpaired t-test. Let us first run the pair t-test between the treated and untreated groups of samples taking into account the non-independence between them. So here you see, this is the t-test formula. We're going to test whether there is any effect on treatment by considering the paired relationship, right? We have each individual with uh, untreated observation and the treated observation. So this is how the result gives us. So we run the t-test and we get the t-statistic 1.5. Its degree of freedom is equal to one. It, the reason is because we only have two individuals. So we have two differences and because we're testing one mean. So two minus one give us one degree of freedom and the p-value associated with that is 0 0.3743, okay? And we have the 95% confidence interval for the mean parameter, which is very wide and covers zero. So we don't do rejection. Okay, and the mean differences, nine, you recall that's the slope estimate. So you see that the t-value 1.5 and the p-value 0.3743 reported by the pair t-test are identical to the one obtained by LMM using the NLME function or LMER with REML equal to true. Let's go back here. So you see 1.5 t-value, 1.5 t-value and go back further. Uh, the t-value 1.5 right here, p-value 0 
That's exactly here, 0 0.3743. They reported um, the mean of difference nine also agrees with the fixed effect as they from the LMER and LME for the slope, okay? Now, what is the pair t-test exactly doing? Well, the idea of the pair t-test is to make the setup look like a one sample t-test where values in one group are tested for significant deviation from zero, which is a sort of the mean of the second group. In other words, we can view a pair t-test as if we shift the intercepts of the individual fits or the mean value of the untreated group down to zero. So let's go back to that figure. What we mean is that for the two lines, when you do a pair t-test, you shift this line and this line, or this point and this point both down to zero. So you ignore their difference in the intercepts or in the untreated group. And then once you shift, you just compare the differences you get and see if they are, they support or they reject the null hypothesis that the effect is zero. That's what you do. So you are shifting the, the two lines to diminish the differences of individuals in the intercept. So that's that's why you no longer to need you no longer to account for the different intercepts of individuals using a random intercept. That's the reason. Okay. So then we can say that the pair t test is a special case of random intercept model. Let's see here. In a simple way, this would be equivalent up to subtracting untreated response values from the treated ones, transforming the response value to response standardized, okay, as shown below, and perform an unpaired t-test on the response standardized variable instead of response. So you see what the author did in R is that for the response, what he did is that he just subtracting the um, difference. So subtracting itself. So for the treatment untreated group, they become zero. Okay, the response becomes zero. And for the treated group, he subtract by the same intercept to shift them downwards. So after creating the standardized response, and then he just run the t-test with the unpaired t-test and for the four observations with a transform or shift the response and test whether they have mean zero. And then that's the output. You see, this is the original response. This is the shifted response. Because this is zero, this is the untreated 10, it becomes zero. Another untreated three becomes zero. And this one is 25 minus 10, that's 15. This is six minus three, that's three. So you're going to do the one sample t test on these four numbers. Okay. And that's it. So you see 1.5 t-statistic p-value stays as 0.73743, right? That agrees with the paired t-test. Okay, then let's look at the math. How can we derive the estimate the linear mixed mix model on this toy data set using hand? Now let's try to derive a few LM equations using our toy data set. We will again have a look at the four data points and make some mathematical notations for the treatment effect beta, which is nothing else than fixed effect, and the blockwise structure U, which is our delta, but he uses U here due to points clustering within two individuals, which is actually the random effect contribution. We are going to express the response coordinates Y in terms of beta and U parameters. Okay, so this is what the author wrote. So he basically had four points, so he can write them out uh, individually. So this is for individual one untreated. This is individual two untreated. So that's the second sub index. And this is individual one treated. So that's what we call Y21. So the first index for treatment, second index for individual and Y22. So the fixed effect here is beta one for untreated, beta two for treated. And for the random effect, so that's the individual wise effect. So U Y for U one for individual one, U two for individual two. And of course we have the random error term for each observation. So that's epsilon one, one, two, one, one, two, two, two. 
that's it. So I hope that writing it out, it can give you a better idea to skater form about what we're talking about. I think probably it's better you look at this first, understand this first, and then you understand the matrix form. Okay, so I introduced that. So beta one, beta two for untreated, treated, and U1, U2 for individual one, individual two. Okay, so here's the argument. So beta one is the response of the individual in the untreated state. Beta two is the response on the treatment. That beta one is the mean of the untreated samples while beta two is the mean of the treated samples. The variables U1 and U2 are block variables accounting for effects specific to individual one and individual two. Finally, epsilon ij is the residual error or what we call the random error. The error we can't model and can only try to minimize as the goal of the maximum likelihood optimization problem. He therefore, we write down the response variable y as a combination of parameters beta u, that is fixed and random effects, and epsilon. In the general form, the system of algebraic equations can be written as equation two. Let's take a look. This is equation one. We have one line per observation and we can put them in the block form that we are familiar with, okay? This is the fixed effect, this is the random effect. So the second part of matrix is denoting the membership or group membership. These first two observations belong to individual one, the last two observations belong to individual two. Okay, here's some language that the author used, so it's just a good to know. X is called a design matrix, which we're familiar with. K is called a block matrix. It codes the relationship between the data points. We used to call the random effect design matrix, but I think it's better to cut block matrix based on the author's argument. So, but it's just depending on the language or the literature. That is whether they come from related individuals or even from the same individual, like in our case. It is important to know that the treatment is modeled as fixed effect because the levels treated, untreated, exhaust all possible outcomes of treatment. In contrast, the blockwise structure of the data is modeled as a random effect since, this is important, since the individuals were sampled from a population and might not correctly represent the entire population of individuals. In other words, there is an error associated with the random effects. That is the beta J, we assume, so I think there's some notation minor issue because the J should be the subscript and S should be the subscript. Okay, that's better. Sigma S squared. Well, the fixed effects are assumed to be error free. So for example, sex is usually modeled as a fixed effect because it's usually assumed to have only two levels, males, females. And uh, while batch effects in life sciences should be modeled as random effects because potentially additional experimental protocols or labs will produce many more, that is many levels, systematic differences between samples that confound the data analysis. Okay, here's the rule of thumb for us to decide which are considered fixed effects, which are random effects. One could think that fixed effects should not have many levels, while random effects typically are typically multi-level categorical variables where the levels represent just a sample of all possibilities, but not all of them. So like the individuals, they are just a random sample of human population. And in our previous example, the schools, they are just a random sample of all the schools. Okay, so now let's proceed with deriving the mean and the variance of the data points, why? Since both the random effect error, that's the sigma square and the, re, oh, sorry, the sigma s square and the residual error, that's sigma square. So in here, the notation, that sigma square is the residual error and the sigma s square is the random effect error. Um, come from normal distribution with zero mean. While the non-zero component expected, expected of y only originates from the fixed effect. One can express the expected value of y as equation five, okay? And next, the variance of the fixed effect term is zero as fixed effects are assumed to be error-free. Therefore, for the variance, right? This is the thing we derived before. It's just that here, this is called a K. And what do we have before? We have Z, 
we have Z delta. So we have Z, Z transpose. Here's K, K transpose. And because we have this, this random effect error, it's just a scalar. Previously, we used G to denote it, and we use R to denote that. We give a more general form, but this is the more specific form for the random intercept model or for the special toy example. So that's the variance of Y. So then together, this, at this sigma y has this blockwise form. You recall that. Previously in our last lecture, we wrote omega squared plus sigma squared, omega squared. Here the notation is sigma s squared instead of omega squared. So we see that there is some dependence for the two observations within each individual, but there's no correlation between individuals. Okay, so yeah. So for this one, Okay, there's something which is used in genetics, actually. The matrix in front of sigma squared, this one, KK transpose is called kinship matrix, and it's given by equation seven. So this kinship matrix codes all relatedness between data points. For example, some data points may come from genetically related people, geographic, geographic locations in close proximity. Some data points may come from technical replicates. So these are all encoded as ones. Those relationships are encoded in the kinship matrix. Thus, the various covariance matrix of data points in equation six, this one is actually here, takes the form of equation eight. Once we have obtained the variance covariance matrix, we can continue with optimization procedure of the maximum likelihood function that requires variance covariance. Okay, so this is the likelihood, right? This is the multivariate Gaussian function, density function that gave us the likelihood. Here we have two beta parameters, two variance parameters. So together four parameters. Once we take the log, we have the simpler form, okay? And then what remains is the optimization. We need to estimate beta. We need to estimate the sigma s squared, sigma squared into the sigma y. So basically what's left here is just the algebra. And the author here showed that, okay, he could do it using the symbolic derivation because here we have, we need to take the determinant. Okay, the determinant of this, four by four matrix, which is very tedious. So he used this uh, maple, or I have used the Mathematica. So it's a very useful way for doing the symbolic calculation. It doesn't require numbers. So you just input your matrix like this, if you can see clearly. Yeah, you input like this, then you can do the determinant. It will require the output still as symbols and you can take the inverse of the matrix, you can do it. So you can do a lot of this calculation in this software. And so that can save you a lot of labor. Anyway, so after this, we can get a determinant of that covariance matrix of Y. And we can also evaluate that term, the square term in the likelihood like this. And finally, we are going to, actually there's a mistake. It's actually maximization of the log likelihood instead of minimization. If you do minimization, it should be minimization of the negative log likelihood. And then you can use the optim R function. You just input those four arguments. You see in the log likelihood, you input beta one, beta two, sigma square, sigma square. You input those as arguments, okay? And then you just optimize the function, that's your f. So here you use the, if you use the optim, the, def, the default is to do the minimization. So you want to input f as the negative log likelihood and it will turn, return the four parameter estimates, beta one, beta two, sigma square, sigma square. And let's finally compare it with what we have. Okay, so in the output sigma is this number, and sigma s is this number. So which exactly equal to what we have from the LME and LMR, ER with REML equals false, right? Which means we do the ML, like maximum likelihood instead of the REML. In particular, so the fixed effect 6.5 is the mean of untreated sample in agreement with the intercept fix 
and beta 2 equals 15 point, yeah, 6.5, 15.5. So they agree with what we have seen before. Yeah, so exactly this shows that in this simple case, how we do the optimization problem as in the numerical way. That's the, this very intuitive introduction for the LMM from scratch. So I would encourage everyone who is still puzzled by the LMM to read this blog in detail. And the same, the same author wrote this ML versus REML in another blog. So I'm, I'm going to skip that for the time's sake, but you can also read it yourself about the variance estimation. Okay, so finally, let's look at something I want to say. This is a set of slides I found online from a professor, Dr. Cecilia Anai from Wisconsin Medicine. So she talked, she, she gave this lecture, I think several years ago about the REML. And what is, what's very important here is about the inference part. Okay, so- uh, I have a question about the MLM like likelihood. So is the ML, uh, LMM likelihood like, like often the time uh, convex. So you only have a, a single maximum. So such- Yes, because, because likelihood is just based on the Gaussian function. So it's just a Gaussian probability density function. So unless your sigma y, this variance has, this covariance matrix has a very special form. Otherwise you shouldn't have a problem to find the minimizer of the sigma square and sigma square. Okay. It's convex in beta for sure. I think mm -hmm. the, the tricky part is just what this form is like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yes. Okay, so she talked about the same thing we talked before. So you can also, I also posted a link to RCSLE. You can read the details. Okay, so one thing I want to say is about this. Okay, we want to test the random effects. For example, we want to test whether we do need to include a random effect. Then we want to test whether that random effect has variance equal to zero. Because if it is, we don't need to include that random effect. Okay, so clearly the hypothesis, now hypothesis is that the random effect variance is zero, alternative is greater than zero. So what's your intuition? Your intuition is that you want to do the likelihood ratio test. But you know, here the thing is that we are alternative, it's just one sided, which means that we know by nature the variance couldn't be negative. It's either zero or positive. So that's why, you know, the LMER package doesn't provide a standard error for variance components. Because if they do, you do the variance plus minus two times standard error, it doesn't make any sense because you shouldn't have a negative variance. Okay. So then if you do likelihood, what would you do? You are going to fit a model without that variance effect and the model with that variance effect. And you want to compare their log likelihood. So essentially the log likelihood ratio statistic is just a difference in their deviances. And clearly if you use that likelihood ratio asymptotic distribution, the chi-square distribution will have degrees of freedom equal to the difference in parameters. So if you're testing one random effect component, then the degree of freedom difference is one, right? You only get rid of one parameter. But this is just the case as we have seen for the negative binomial regression versus Gaussian regression. We also said that the negative binomial has one more parameter than Poisson has. But because that parameter we are testing its boundary value. So here, the sigma square equal to zero is also about a borderline. So this borderline parameter value will have some issue with, a, we have some likelihood ratio theory that this one, that really does not hold for the border or boundary. So that's why if we directly use the chi-square one distribution, we are being too conservative because the actual distribution for the test statistic under the null is a combination of a zero point mass and chi-square one. So that's why if you use chi-square one, your p-value will be larger than what you expect, okay? So, so here in the slides, the author proposed to use a parametric bootstrap based p-value, which is more accurate. And this is something we could do with powerful computers. So what we do is that we are going to simulate data under the fitted null model. 
And then we use the simulated data to fit the two models, the null model, the alternative model, and compute the test statistic. So we get one value for each simulation. And once we repeat the simulation for say 1,000 times, we're going to get 1,000 null values of this test statistic. That will give us a valid null distribution. And then we can use that simulation-based null distribution to get us a p-value instead of using the asymptotic chi-square one. So that will give us a more accurate p-value. Okay, so let's take a look at what we do uh, with that simulation-based case. Okay, so let's take a look. So here we fit two models. So in this model, we have a random intercept in addition to the fixed intercept. In the second model, we only have the fixed intercept. So comparing these two models here, we have one more random effect parameter. And here's how we calculate the test statistic as the deviance of the two things, okay? This is the linear model. This is the linear mixed effect model. Okay, and we get the test statistic value. And here is we, if we use the chi-square one as the null distribution, a very small p-value. Because we know that here the p-value is inflated. So we can stop here because we know even if the, p, the real p-value should be smaller than this, but given this is already small enough, being smaller than that will give us the same rejection decision. So this is the case where we are okay. Okay, so with this conservative p-value, it will not affect our decision if it's already small enough. But if we really want to do the simulation, here's what we do. Let me just quickly scroll down to that part. This is a function building in R called simulate, which is super nice, which means that given a fitted model, you given a fitted linear model, you could simulate new responses based on the fitted value. Okay. So that means you are going to draw, so for example, the fit SP is what we have here. So basically what the author did is that she first fitted a random, a linear LMM with sex as the fixed parameter effect. And he, she considered two random intercepts. One is based on the group by population, the other is based on the group by group. So she has two factors and she wants to consider their random intercepts. So that's the first model. In the second model, she removed the random effects of population. So she could actually say update this model by minus one minus group. So it's a very simple way to get a second model by removing the random effects here. So she has two models and she will fit them using the LNER function. So what's nice here is that when you do the update, so you will have automatic fitting by LMER, all right? And then you will have two models fitted. So based on this second smaller fitted model, she used the simulated simulate function to generate new responses. And so when she run this for once, she are, she's going to get a set of new responses. And based on the new responses, you see what she did is that she will use the new response to do the regression. So she still fit a null model without the group, random effect group, and she fit alternative, including the random intercept of a group. So with those two new models, she could do the ANOVA for model comparison, and she could get the test statistic value, which is the chi-square. That's the test statistic value, okay? So she get that, that's the value, and that's from the, where she know the data really comes from the null. And she repeat that for many times. So what she did is she wrap up this data generation model fitting, get a test statistic into one function, and then she can, each time she run the function, she get one value for the null, one null value for the test statistic. So she do that continuously. And then what she did is that she repeat this simulation for 10,000 times. So that will give her a distribution of the null test statistic value. This histogram is what she get by simulation. And this curve is what she got for chi-square one. So you can clearly see that the chi-square one is more conservative because it has heavier tails than the true now. So whenever you have the value here, 
test statistic value here, you calculate the right tail probability as its p-value, you will get a bigger p-value from chi-square one than from the simulation based null distribution. Okay, so for the same test statistic, we can see that using the null, we are going to get a p-value with 0 0.009, which is very big, which is very small, sorry. But if we use the chi-square one, which she did in the beginning, chi-square one, you see, that's 0 0.658. Oh, no, 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 not this one, sorry. Let's just scroll back down. Yeah, 0 0.02, sorry, my bad. That's the p-value based on the chi-square one, which is bigger. 0 0.01 is much bigger than the 0 0.008. So this is one example to show that, yes, so to be more exact, if you have more powerful computer to carry out the simulation based p value calculation, you prefer to do this instead of using the asymptotic chi square distribution for likelihood ratio test. That's the take home message from this deck of slides. Okay, so and there are some further examples about the fixed effects, which I'm going to ignore. So basically, when your sample size is not big, for the fixed effects, if you use the chi-square distribution as the null distribution, it's also not accurate. So you could also use the simulation-based approach to get yourself more accurate p-values. All right, so I'll stop here. And so our next lecture will be postponed to next Tuesday about the model selection based on AIC, BIC, Mallow CP, and corrected AIC. And that last part is optional, and it's not going to be included in your homework, last homework. So for your last homework, you should be able to do all the problems with, uh, with the lecture so far. All right, so thank you all for today's lecture, for attending today's lecture, and I'll see you on next Tuesday. Bye. Thank you.